And I really want to thank you all for coming and, uh, and being open to something maybe new or something that might be familiar to you. So hopefully I can add to your experience of birding. I've, um, my husband and I still bird uh, as a hobby, but I did it professionally for about six years. And uh, since then, I've been more on the mystical path. So studying shamanism and earth-based spirituality is a, another um, more kind of understandable way to work with it. But today I'm going to talk about spirit birding, and um, it's uh, something I have really been exploring kind of haphazardly for a number of years, and um, I explored a little more in depth in uh, the book I recently wrote. Um, and now I'm starting to systematize it. So the, you're the first audience really that in a really clear way is going to get to see all the ways I'm kind of breaking it out. Uh, there's lots of power animal interpretation books out there, so you can look up um, bear or uh, raccoon, things like that, and see what they mean to um, in myths and legends and symbolically in terms of metaphor for uh, different ways we can live our lives. Uh, but these books are, I've always been very frustrated because the best we can get in terms of birds is raven, owl, hawk, eagle, they don't break it down by species. And as a birder, I want to know at the species level what these things mean. So that's what I've been studying on my own. And um, now you get the opportunity to see um, what, that, what the fruits of that look like. And so I'm going to essentially do my best to teach how to um, take these sightings of individual species and decipher what the message might mean. And, um, Can I just start? Uh, is yeah. It, is it focused? It looks kind of a little. Good question. I don't know how to do I mean, it's readable. I just don't know if that. Ah, look at that. Much, Much better. better. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> now you don't feel like you're having eye problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, first of all, you know, the. Kind of even the question before this question is what is a message from a bird? Um, and we'll get into that. That'll be what the whole remainder of the talk is. But first, I want to look at um, which sightings are messages. So um, really, in my this is kind of like when people come to me and say, um, how many power animals do I have? Or how many totem animals do I have? Well, they, they can all be a uh, power animal or totem animal. Uh, but with birds, uh, I feel the same way. Every experience we have out in nature in general can be a message uh, that can help us discern how to live our lives differently, how to grow within ourselves. Uh, but just for the sake of knowing what to do and how to get started, let's focus on some of the memorable sightings. And the surprising or startling appearance of a bird is a good one. I definitely have been um, jumped out of my skin by a barn owl in the middle of the night, uh, things like that. Tough to identify birds. So a bird that you spend an hour tracking through the forest, uh, you can't quite get the right light. Uh, you're, you think you hear the song, but it might be another bird somewhere else, or it's not singing, uh, those kind of things. So you actually spend a lot of time with the bird, and so it has an impact on you once you're able to identify it. And then birds that are rare for the area or rare altogether. Uh, certain birds for the first time. So, you know, we don't often remember our first sighting of a house sparrow or um, a song sparrow, but uh, other birds like um, a vermilion flycatcher, for example, I have a very keen remembrance of the first time seeing that. Uh, dead or injured birds, and uh, harder to deal with, but um, definitely worth taking note of. And then fascinating behavior. So when we get the chance to watch grebes do mating dances on the water, uh, things such as that, that just take your breath away, or harrier hawks doing, um, you know, it's often mating behavior that's really interesting, but also when we get to see a peregrine take a duck on the wing, something along that lines is also very worth noting. And then, yeah, so to see a barn owl in the middle of the day 
on a cliff. This is on, my husband actually took this picture. This is on Santa Barbara Island and the Channel Islands. So that would be a, kind of a rare sighting just because of the time of day and how clear of a picture he got. And then these are um, some northern harrier uh, chicks and nest. And the only reason why this is a rare sighting for me is because they were out on the Channel Islands. It was, this is the first ever recorded nest of northern harriers on the Channel Islands. Um, I had a scientific paper in progress about this and uh, just never got it all the way completed, but it was really amazing to see them nesting. So when we're trying to figure out what to apply the message to, so we're going to spend a lot of time um, kind of distilling down into what the message might mean, but what's the message about? If we don't have anything to apply it back to, there's no reason uh, to do that. It's kind of like Lee, I often uh, put it back to astrology. So when we go and just read a column in the paper, if it's a general astrology column and you're not, and it really doesn't seem to apply to your day, it's not going to mean anything to you altogether. So to be able to figure out what the message is about is really important to be able to apply it back to your life. And the reason why I put this ahead rather than behind is because you have to catch it in the moment. Uh, so the moment you are walking down the trail and the bird catches your attention or you hear it or you see it, uh, that's the time to catch where you're thinking. So what were you just thinking about at that moment? Even if it was something as mundane as the laundry, it's about what kind of mindset you were in at that time. Were you feeling overwhelmed? Were you feeling at peace? All of those things apply. Uh, were you wondering about something? So. Were you wondering, um, you know, some sort of thing about your child at school, how they were going to get through their struggling with math or something along those lines? Uh, were you sleepwalking? So were you just kind of not paying attention to your surroundings? And this was what woke you up. So I have uh, memories of driving down the road, not really even paying attention to where I am on the road. One in particular, and having a metal lark come right in front of the windshield and actually seeing it in slow motion do flaps before it hit the windshield. Uh, that woke me up. Uh, what else is happening in your world? So even if in the moment, what, what's going on doesn't apply, look at the bigger picture. Are you making a decision about buying a new house, a new career, any sort of life change? And that goes into the next part about allowing it to inform larger questions in your life. So what bigger question have you been holding? Sometimes we're wondering what our purpose is in life. Uh, and sometimes we're something smaller, like should I ask for a raise at my job? And then are you at a crossroads in your life and trying to make a big decision? And are you struggling with a certain person or project? So a relationship or a project is another good thing to take a look at. And I put all those questions on the handout so um, you can reference them in the future. So there's a couple different ways to go about finding the answer. And just for simplicity's sake, uh, I've break, broken them into kind of six different categories of what type of answer, what type of problem we're looking to solve, and, and then what part, uh, first of all, in the bird's life history or habits should we take a look at. And this is, these aren't hard and fast rules, it just helps us, give us some direction. Because if we start taking a look at the whole of the bird, um, all their migration patterns, all their breeding habits, all those kind of things, it can get really overwhelming and you don't know how to apply uh, what to where. So um, it would be going back to the, you know, what is the message about and then figuring out which category here this fits into. Um, and so I'm going to give a couple examples of career and education will be the first one. And so we're going to look at how the bird makes a living, what are their foraging habits, and what do they eat. And then I'll show you how this works. So the first example on the far left there is a black neck stilt. And they are a ground gleaner. So they go around in the mud, right, and pick... Uh, different, mostly they do brine flies and pick those out of the water or the shore. 
And so if you're looking at a career and you're looking at what's my next move in my career or how do I approach this, an issue in my career, get your feet wet. These are waders, right? So that would be, it's really fun because you start to play with idioms and um, things like that. So yeah, get, go ahead, get your feet wet and then start dabbling around, you know, start just probing around into the shallow water of the shore and just start to get familiar with what's going on. And that would be, um, in short, the guidance there. That, and that would be a lot different of an answer from a northern harrier hawk. They're out coursing over open land 70% of the time, looking and listening for prey. So they're one of the few, they're the only hawk, right, that has the facial disc where they can, uh, the sound comes in just like an owl and it's collected to their ears. So that's very significant in looking at this and then the fact that they're active, they're out all of the time looking and listening for prey. So in your career, the, uh, or if you're doing an education or looking at doing an education, the answer would be to get out and start watching and start listening and start paying attention to your surroundings and, and letting information come in and then seeing what little morsels of rodents or you know, meat are in the, in the bush below that are hidden that you can go and catch up. Then the last example, another very different example, peregrine falcon. And uh, we all know them, they stoop, and then they also, you know, very quick, short flight after things, you know, on a horizontal plane. So they're all about speed. So this would be a completely different example than the harrier and the stilt too. The answer here would be go for it, you know, go for it, find what you want, you know, hone in on your target and go for it right away. Don't, don't dabble around um, and just get your feet wet. Really go in with a full dive and, and make your decision about what you're gonna do. So the, and a lot of times I find that when I, um, and when I have these different encounters and I find these messages within that, I kind of, I also go back and check it in with my intuition. And almost all of the time, it's what my intuition's been telling me and what my fear has been saying, no, 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 don't do it, you know? So this helps a lot of times give me a lot of extra confidence about, okay, yes, that was, um, that is what I need to do. And now I feel I have this really beautiful example in the form, you know, in feathered form of what to do. And so anytime I start to get fearful or start to have doubt about my intuition and about how to move forward, I instantly can pull that image back into mind and focus in on that. And that brings confidence back in, which is a really amazing thing too. Any questions so far? Okay. So the next example is parenting or mentoring. And the reason why um, I, I, I added mentoring on here is because I don't have children, so, um, but it, this still applies to anyone. So even training someone on the job or training volunteers, um, that kind of thing um, is how do you, if you're working as the master and someone's apprenticing with you, how do you help them learn? Uh, teacher, student, that kind of relationship as well. So we're gonna look at the chicks, are they altricial or precocial? And how long do they spend with their parents? Those kind of questions are the ones you would ask. You'd really hone in on that part of the bird's biology. So I gave a, a number of examples here. Um, all of these pictures are ones either myself or my husband have taken. So it was kind of fun, you know, I thought about, well, should I go online and do image searches and find like key examples? And I, and I thought, no, it's a lot more fun if I have to pick out of my photo album because it's a lot more real, you know, rather than picking the pictures that matches the thing, I have to find the pictures and then, and then do it like we would have to in the field. So these are, um, I guess we'll start with the biggest over on the left. Caspian terns. And their chicks, I had to write myself a cheat sheet because I don't have all this stuff. I always have to look these things up. Their chicks are semi precocial. So, what that means is they are born with their eyes open, they are covered with down. They're capable of leaving the nest, but they actually decide to stay. And it's an interesting little scrape. So in this case, you think of yourself as the master, right, or the teacher, 
um, the tutor, the mentor, and the chick as um, the student. So the guidance here would be to definitely be bringing a lot of knowledge, be bringing a lot of help in the, in the form of food. You know, Caspian terns bring whole fish actually to the nest that these chicks will, you know, sometimes they sit there. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Caspian terns, but sometimes they sit there with the fish half out of their mouth for hours as the fish digests in their belly before they can swallow more. So that would tell you to make sure you bring big chunks, big morsels of knowledge or learning. So, you know, maybe give that student or child, you know, a big book or a, or a whole bunch of books on a topic and let them digest it slowly. And it might take them a while to swallow it down. It might look like, geez, are they choking? <laughs> you know, or is they, are they not gonna ever get through all of that? And just give them some time. And also they might look like the student or the uh, child might look like they can leave the nest and look very independent and out ready to go out on their own, but they're gonna choose to stay. And so how are you gonna relate to that? Will you just keep taking care of them and, and letting them grow up as it is? Uh, also, these are col um, colony nesting birds. Obviously, they nest in thousands, if not tens of thousands. And uh, they, so, you know, Doing this in a group setting is also a good idea, so maybe homeschooling wouldn't be the best thought. And like I said before, the idea is not to follow this information blindly. So if you come across, you know, you have an experience with Caspian Terns or you get to go see a colony for the first time and you weren't expecting that experience, uh, the thing is, and you get out there and you start thinking about the chicks and that's not really how I want to raise my children or how it's working with my children, or it seems to even bring up some sort of resistance about, wow, I, I really want them to be able to leave the nest early or all of those kind of things. It's worth looking at the resistance that comes up in you around that, type, that style of parenting. Why do you feel that way? Maybe it's time to kind of soften around that and maybe try something new. Um, but it's always worth checking in with ourselves and not fall, it's just like astrology readings or you know, when people go see psychics, let's not follow these things blindly. Uh, let's see how it feels with us. Is it something that's comfortable or not? Uh, the barn swallows are altricial. So they are born with eyes closed. They have little or no down, they're little naked things. They can't leave the nest and they're fed by parents. So these are gonna be pretty helpless and at the start and gonna need uh, a lot of support, these kind of students. And that would be the message there, our children. The mallards on the opposite end of the spectrum. How many of you have seen mallards in little flocks, you know, walking across streets and they seem way too little to be able to do that. But pretty much as soon as they're born, they're ready to go. Uh, this is as, um, precocial as we get uh, on this continent. Uh, they still do need their parents. Uh, they still do stay with their parents, and, but they get their own food. They're able to move quick, so, very soon after they are hatched and they go you know, wandering pretty quickly. So these are gonna be independent little ones and just need the parent around just to kind of help direct and where to go and find the food sources. Uh, and then the owl, great horned owls are semi altricial so they're a little bit closer to the barn swallows. They have their eyes closed. When they're born, they're incapable of leaving the nest and they're fed by their parents and have down. So you see, even just looking at altricial versus precocial, there's a lot of different information there. You know, the uh, being born with their eyes closed, they're not able to see where they should go. So it's important for you as a mentor or a teacher to be able, or a parent to be able to have vision about what's next or the path that, this, um, that the child or uh, student is going on. That's how you can use life history and obviously that's kind of an endless uh, study which is what I love about it. And there's this other fun part too uh, that has to do with plumage. And these aren't, you know, when you look at, I, the reason why I add idioms over here on the side for color is because, because this way it helps us see, you know, because we get these um, 
I'm really trying to ground this out, and because I was a scientist for six years, and so I have a very lo logical left brain style, literal world style, and so I really uh, try my best not to do um, kind of out there or made up interpretations of things. I really want to ground it in the human experience and human archetypes as it is in the human psyche. And so by looking at idioms, we see these things that we all associate with these colors all the time, and we don't quite think about it too much. But um, you know, to be able to, to call someone green with envy is a very common, we just take for granted. Um, but also now we have this whole thing of I'm going green to mean that we're going to live more sustainably or have um, get solar panels on our house. And then you have the green light. That's also kind of a newer one, but we use that often um, now that we have traffic lights. So to, you know, to say, go ahead, get going, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then the brown and orange were kind of, it's interesting, I did some research on orange, it's the only color that doesn't have an idiom associated with it, isn't that fun? The only idiom that's associated with it is apples and oranges, you know, comparing apples to oranges. Um, so it doesn't stand on its own. But we have orange alert, you know, like the orange threat alert. You know, we use orange hunting vests. Uh, so it means warning or be on alert, that kind of thing. But it's also often associated with, um, you know, cheeriness, friendliness, and then the color, you know, fire. It's the color of fire. So this is also on um, the worksheets that you have. So. And none of them have good, you know, none of them are inherently good or inherently bad. That's the other thing is I, that I really try to work with. Uh, Any way you look at it is um, depending on uh, where you are or um, what kind of inner questioning you're doing. Um, you could go into with black, you know, seeing it to represent the shadow, uh, fear or emptiness, which could be negative things or you could see it as silence or mystery, you know, to always look at things on a neutral plane and not have any um, hang up about them or negative connotation around them. So here's a number of different examples and I'm kind of going to just go through them pretty quick. But oyster catchers, black oyster catchers on the far left there. So they're mostly black. So with them, the guidance or the answer to the question would be more about the mystery. And, you know, as being shorebirds, like again with the black neck stilt, uh, we're looking at probing the mystery. So if you're really been sitting with a question for a while and you're feeling really uncertain with that, um, this is kind of asking the question, well, how comfortable are you being probing the mystery and being in the mystery? This is an island jay, which is a relative of the scrub jay. And the, being the color blue, like they are, if we look back at blue, it relates over to water, spirituality often is associated with it, sadness, you know, I'm feeling blue, uh, or knowledge. So some people who have a lot of knowledge talk until they're blue in the face. <laughs> So that would be, you know, even even if you put this all, I could each picture I could spend half an hour talking about. But even if you put this all in the context of the environment that the bird is in, so here the bird is come, it's come up above the bushes and it's getting a wide angle view. So this could um, one interpretation for this could be to take a wide angle view on what you know about your life or how you feel about um, your spirituality, or those kind of questions. Or if you're dealing with some grief and sadness, get your head above the clouds. You know, that would be an example there. This is a rufous hummingbird. And mostly, you know, the color orange with a little bit of uh, gold mixed in there, right? Very much fiery colors. So what are you on fire about right now, especially in the form of a hummingbird, something that moves so fast and has such a fast heart rate? You know, what are you feeling passionate about? Or maybe should you be more on fire or passionate about things? White pelicans down in the left. That could be, uh, the color white can be about getting clear in a situation. Uh, and then we've got a Xanthus merlet here. 
and they are white and black. So there's another idiom for black and white. You know, she's seeing things in black and white. Are you seeing the world in black and white and having, and that's the trouble? Or should you, are you feeling like you're in the gray and it's time to start making some decisions and deciding yes to this and no to that? And then we come to one of the many little brown birds, <laughs> hermit thrush. What do you do with those? <laughs> um, that's a uh, Harris's flycatcher, I think. Uh, what do you do with the little brown bird or the bird that has a bunch of colors? And that's a question that I've um, sat with a lot. And really the best fit I've found is a little uh, slightly unconventional. <laughs> Definitely in the scientific world, it's unconventional. But this is the um, idea of chakras. If you read the definition down below, uh, they're from yogic or tantric traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism, and they're considered to be energy centers of the body. And a lot of different uh, alternative healing practitioners work uh, with the concept of these energy centers of the body. I've actually seen sketches of anatomy. We have um, nerve plexis, plexis and artery plexis at these given points in the body. So these are actually like energy or uh, centers for the body. And in, the, in these old religious traditions, they used these to gain, you know, to get to nirvana, to gain enlightenment. They worked through these chakras. There was a lot of teaching around each one. These days in uh, the Western world, they are worked more with in, in the view of self-growth, of inner questioning, of those kind of things, of self-evolution, basically being better people in the world. You know, we can work through the principles of the chakras for that kind of thing. But the reason why I bring them into play here is because there's no reason why you can't put chakras on a bird's, you know, view them on a bird's body, horse's body, dog, whatever. And so then when you start looking at this, you're like, oh, maybe if they have a throat that's a certain color, that means something. So that's the fun part. And like I said, this is a thousands of years old tradition. So I just am giving you here a very brief, um, just to help it so it's simpler for you as you get started with this, uh, but very brief associations. That each chakra has its own color, as you see. Um, but it also has its own associations. And yeah, I gave you a very kind of big picture on those. And we'll look at a few examples. This is uh, Grasha. She's a red-tailed hawk that I worked with in a raptor education program. I actually helped train her to the glove. And during my time, we spent about a year together. And during my time working with her, I was really yearning for companionship from humans to really, because I was starting to explore uh, my own inner path and shamanism and, my, and the unseen aspect of what my connection with nature looked like. And I was just, craving to, uh, uh, to have friends to share that with at the same time that I was working with her. And it just like organically, and I didn't know this was happening at the time. I, I just, in the last couple months, to be honest, I've started to really put it all together. Um, but organically, I, so I accumulated friends kind of from different areas of my life. So I was working at a farm. I had one friend from there. I had another friend from the uh, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center and another friend from the horse barn where I was at. And all three of them were all interested in the same things we were finding. We were having these conversations about uh, energy systems and what is the soul and what are power animals and those kind of questions. And I got all three of them with, you know, together at my house and we started getting together once a month and spending time having conversations about these things. So for, for me, I really got to have the experience of tribe on a soul level deeper than what I'd had before. And, on a, and yeah, in a much um, more powerful connection. And red-tailed hawks, 
have a red tail. So the root chakra, which is associated with tribe and survival and family, it's all of those things that we're concerned about when we're um, babies, toddlers, you know, up to a year or two old. Um, that's the most important thing to us. And that's really what the root chakra is about, is all those issues around that and not being afraid to share things among friends. Um, the fear of humiliation is associated with the root chakra. So to really become empowered in that during the same time that I, then she's the only red tail that I've ever worked with, uh, was very significant and really spoke to me in that way. And it's, you know, I, it's, I write about her in my book and share all of those experiences, but it was really only about three months ago that I put this diagram together and I got it on a whole nother level than what I'd gotten it before. That's the fun part too, is we start to understand it uh, in layers. Um, does anybody know what this bird is? These are, I'm throwing some seabirds in here, so they're, cormorant? yep. Do you know what species of cormorant? Okay. This is a Brant's cormorant, and um, they are, we, you typically don't see them unless you go on pelagic trips or um, you go out to really rocky islands out on the west coast. They usually don't nest on man-made structures. Um, there's a colony that nests on Alcatraz Island. Um, yeah, and, and then one other, I think in Yahats up, uh, Bay, they have a colony up there. And then this one in the Columbia River estuary, uh, they're nesting on pile dikes. And so this was what I wrote my scientific um, paper on. I climbed up on these pile dikes and collected pellets and did nest counts. Because um, this was the only third time had been documented of them uh, nesting on a man-made structure which there's a rare sighting type of thing. And at this time in my life, I was, I think I was um, around 21, 22 at that time. And I was working in a really big project. I was a joint project with Oregon State University and uh, Department of Wildlife, uh, University of Washington was involved. There was a lot going on, um, really big money in the project. It was really focused on Caspian terns and some on gulls, um, western um, glaucous wing hybrids, and double-crested cormorants. And looking at how those seabird species were impacting salmonid populations in the Columbia River. Uh, so obviously the uh, dam operators who get all the flack for uh, really decreasing the salmon population were interested in knowing if the birds were having an impact on the salmon and then because the birds were nesting on man-made islands. So if that was the case, they wanted to move the birds out. Um, so I was a part of this really larger project, and it was a great group of people to work with, but I felt very lost in the crowd. Um, you know, I felt like I was kind of a cog in the wheel of all the different things that were going on, and a lot of people kind of had their own little independent side projects that they were doing. They were collecting, even though they were all working together, each person had their own little subset of data that they were collecting. So to be able to uh, find these birds and then get support from my teammates that I was working with to, because I had to liter literally get taken out there on a boat and as the boat was doing this, I mean the pile dike was like way over my head and slippery and I was in rain gear. <laughs> um, so to have all of their support, um, there was usually two of us that went up there and collected um, and, get, and to get out there every seven to 10 days was a really um, awesome thing. And then to be able to you know, bring into the world my own expression of a study that I had done was a really kind of coming of age experience. And if, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it just, it totally fits exactly with um, throat chakra type of learning. And, and then to have these birds that have a blue throat is Really, this is something really in the last two weeks I just came upon. So every, everything I look at, I see it, it's so much fun. So um, that sort of answers the question on, you know, what to do with birds that are, have a lot of different colors. You know, you can kind of pick one area that's really significant, like the red tail. Like, of course, you're gonna notice that. And, um, and then with the Brant's cormorant, the blue throat, uh, everything else is black, so. Uh, that's helpful there, but what do you do when um, you've got kind of a mixture of things going on and how do you make sense of that? And 
So this little guy, this orange crowned warbler, most of you might know of this. There's quite a few in the area. Uh, they are all green with a little bit of gray on the back, you know, depending on the subspecies. And then they have this orange crown, but you're not going to see it in the field. You don't see it through binoculars unless you have the bird in hand and you're looking at them from above. You can see the little orange feathers underneath. Um, and then the thing is, too, so the one very distinguishable marking that they have is the orange crown. Well, the crown chakra is purple, so it doesn't match up with that either, right? So what do you do with all of that? And so I always go back to, OK, what's the like most base level uh, type of idiom that I can find? And um, having an orange head would be you know, having your head on fire about something, really being passionate and thinking a lot about something. And, and then to have this overall green body, but with a little bit of gray mixed in, not like incredibly in your face type of green, you know, would talk about blending in. They very much blend in with their surroundings, but they're, and they're very, you know, we, we look at the kind of ecology or eco aspect of it, they're very green little birds. <laughs> so, you know, this could really be about having your head on fire about, um, about something. And that something may very well be uh, nature or ecology or environmentalism, but not in a overly outwardly insane way. So you know, if this if he had like an orange crest, that would be someone who's like over the top, <laughs> head on fire about. You know, if he had an orange crest and a green body, he'd be um, someone who's standing in front of the bulldozers or the pipeline, right? Um, and this is. This is kind of hidden under the entire guise of just being an environmentalist and being passionate about nature. And then we can look into the biology of the bird and see here that they are gleaners. So they spend a lot of time picking bugs off of branches and leaves and hopping around from place to place. And really, in a fun way too, that really relates to people who are environmentalists, who are into sustainability and that kind of thing, because they're not going to go like a woodpecker and drive a hole through a tree to make a nest or um, you know, really have a big impact uh, tearing things apart to try and eat, to get to food or whatever. They have a low impact. They glean. They take whatever's there. Um, and let's see, they're breeding. They're monogamous. So if you were looking at um, this in a relationship perspective, even if it's a relationship with a friend that you're trying to uh, break down and get another viewpoint on, it'd be spending some time one-on-one -on -one with that person. You might want to consider that, or maybe you've had too much, and, and, it, and that helps bring that out for you. Uh, and then there's very slight dimorphism in them. So that means that the male and females are very, very similar in size and color. So in terms of that friendship, you know, are you very similar or do you think you should be very similar? And if you're not, how does that feel? You know, so that's where you can start getting into the questioning there around it. They're young or altricial, so just like the uh, barn swallows. Uh, so if you're looking at this from a parenting aspect, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with those little helpless babies as they grow up. They uh, are ground or low nesters. So that means spending a lot of time kind of laying low, not getting too lofty or high in your ideals. And then like we were talking, I was talking about before, you know, they live in a wooded habitat. Uh, they migrate south for the winter and can leave another significant, and I always try to find the thing that's significant about the species that stands out. Of, of, so like the Brant's cormorants, it was like they don't usually nest on man-made structures. Um, and you look at the northern harriers, they're usually, you know, they usually don't find them out on an island nesting. So I try to, when I'm reading about their biology and their life history, I try to find what the books point out or the website or whatever points out as being the unique thing about that species because that is typically a big part of the message. So the fact that they, um, the boreal, uh, so the boreal birds of this species, the ones that are farther north, they leave really late in their migration. 
So that might be, you might want to wait to be the last one to leave or the last, you might want to wait to the last minute to make a move on this decision that you're making. Um, interesting fact, so this is, this is kind of a big one, uh, feeds at red naped sax, sap sucker wells. So what I would probably do is spend just about, just almost the same amount of time investigating the biology and colors and um, life history of red naped sap suckers as I would these guys. Because then you're looking at the relationship there. Um, especially if your issue or your um, problem you're trying to solve is around relationship, um, relationship to other, you know, someone who's very different than you. Uh, that's worth looking at. Yeah. What is a red naped sap sucker well? Um, the, so sap suckers go to aspens and different trees like that, and they peck out um, a shallow hole right below the bark, and then that hole fills with sap. Yeah, and they do, um, if some trees, if you go and look at them, the trees are filled with wells. They've got little, and they do like exactly the same size holes and they do them almost symmetrically. It's really beautiful. And then they go back to these holes and feed on them o over and over again. But other birds also benefit from that activity. Symbiotic relationship. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yep. And that's where it gets kind of funny. I don't know why the colors are so close, but um, this is considered um, indigo. It's like a dark blue. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And, you know, some people in those religious traditions, they'll actually meditate on those specific colors, and there's um, symbols for each of the chakras that they meditate on. So that's a whole other study. But um, And I'd be glad, I've got, if nobody has questions... I've got another 10 minutes, so I'd be glad if somebody has a bird. I've got some books along. I'd be glad to spend some time kind of diving into that particular bird. If anybody wants to do that. Yeah. Well, we have a, um, a migrating bird that has stopped, and it's the um, white-faced ibis. Oh, wow. Which was quite spectacular mm -hmm. to come upon. And in fact, it was in a group of 11 of them. Um, what would be the... Right. That's a great question. Um, so numerology is another place you can go with this, looking at the number of birds that are there. And um, I've, that's still something I've... There's so many different um, <clears throat> schools of numerology out there. I haven't distilled them down or kind of figured out what seems most in alignment to me. But um, you could... Some people have favorite numbers, like 11 is actually my favorite number. So to me, that would be like a good omen. I don't even know why that's my favorite number. But, but you could think about um, the twins because you have a one standing next to another, you know, well-matched pair. You can do something along those lines. But let's go ahead and look up. What do you know about the white-faced ibis? <laughs> well, I know what it looks like. Right. <laughs> and it, um, it forages on the edges of ponds in the mud. Yeah. And their bill is like eight inches or ten inches long. It's um, quite unusual, I would think. I mean, I've never seen them before. Yeah, they're, they're really beautiful. When, when you see them, yeah. Oh, there they are. Yeah. I, yeah, and I can remember um, in the Klamath, um, I think that's where it is in Northern California. There's a bunch of lakes up there. That's where we where I first saw them. I'm just looking them up and we'll read about them. But I think that's even, even their behavior that they're demonstrating when you see them. So maybe they don't always keep their head down like that, but maybe that day they were so focused on feeding, that was the impression you got of them. And so that impression is as important as what you'll read in a book, you know, about keeping your head down, keeping focused on the task. You know, we have all of these kind of ideas about you put your head down, you go forward, all those kind of things. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And focus in on the small things rather than, you know, looking out and around for what's going on around you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Did anybody see a baby doll? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Thank you. 
Aw. Ibises, here we go, 46. Usually I can find them by flipping, but not today. Okay, so the white-faced ibis. Let's see, they, um, so yeah, it says insects, small vertebrates, so like little shrimp and things like that, and then insects um, diet, aquatic invertebrates, especially crayfish, earthworms, fish, so they probably do some fish. Um, what, I'm interested in what kind of nests they make. Looks like they make um, stick nests. Yeah, in aquatic vegetation, uh, shrub, low tree, occasionally over water, usually on the ground. Deeply cupped platform of coarse emergent vegetation sticks lined with finer materials. So that's different than a floating nest like you would get with a grebe or something, right? Um, but also a lot different than some other shorebirds like um, snowy plovers that have little tiny scrapes in the ground. You can walk past their eggs a you know, hundred times and never see them. That, I did some surveys for those and that was like hopeless. Um, the chicks are semi-altricial, so they um, somewhat helpless in the nest then. And declining throughout their range, yeah, so we know that they're rare. Um, draining of wetlands poses a threat. So yeah, they need water to be able to be able to live. And when you look at that aspect of it, water is often associated with emotion, things like that. So, and then um, I don't know if, have any of you seen this book before? Um, this is the Birder's Handbook. Uh, I've tried to find some, an app or something online that like has this much information in it, so I don't have to carry this big book around. Um, but there's just nothing like it. It's amazing. It's got uh, so it breaks down. Yeah, all how many, how big the clutch sizes are, um, how you know long the incubation is. It's 21 to 22 days, so you can look at that too. Like how many days or hours or whatever should you give to this decision? Because a lot of times um, uh, in different power animal books they will bring that into like um, with bears, they have a really long gestation time. So if you have a new idea, give it a long time to, to incubate. Um, whereas like rabbits are with a moon cycle, you know, so to kind of pay more attention to the cycles of the moon, that kind of thing. So you can look at that as well. Uh, What's the name of your book? My book is Gracious Wild. And this is, a, it's actually a memoir and, um, but it shares my experience of working uh, with those uh, northern harrier hawks that I found nesting um, out on the Channel Islands and, uh, and then with a harrier hawk and a red-tailed hawk in a raptor rehabilitation program. And I have uh, copies here today, so I'd be glad to sign one if you'd like to buy one or two. And um, the one last thing I wanna say about this book is that it's got amazing essays in it that really gives you a synopsis of different uh, scientific papers that have been done. So for each bird, it tells you which essays apply for that bird. So for the white-faced ibis, you would read uh, essays about um, commensal feeding, about piracy, about who incubates the nest. That's an important thing when you're looking at mentoring. Uh, looking at colonies, visual displays, and beaks and bills. So that, you know, with the facing page is the bird itself, the birds themselves, and then all the other pages in this book on the, on the right-hand side are all, es all these essays. So like, you know, they even talk about owls and the, where their ears are situated, and it's incredibly good wealth of information. Yeah, um, and you can definitely pass it around and um, take a look. There's a number of authors. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.